hello everyone. I hope all of you are spending a great time locked up inside and I hope all of you are staying safe. Today we are going to be having a short discussion about the topic sexual reproduction in flowering plants. So let us first uh, talk what is reproduction first. Mm, we all know that except unicellular organisms, every living being has a lifespan which means it has a precise moment of birth and a precise moment of natural death unless obviously some any other uh, mishap happens. So if a living organism dies, how does it ensure that its continuation of species occurs? How does it ensure that in the environment it can leave behind its progeny? That very phenomenon is known as reproduction. Reproduction is a natural phenomenon by which living organisms produce offsprings. Reproduction occurs in almost all living organisms and it has two types, mainly sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. Today we will be talking about sexual reproduction which means the type of reproduction in which gametes, male and female gametes are produced which fuse together, fusion happens and produce the embryo group. Yeah, which produces the zygote which gives, which gives rise to the embryo. So we will be talking about sexual reproduction in flowering plants. What is a flowering plant? A flowering plant belongs to the kingdom plantae. It bears flowers. Our first topic of discussion would be flower. So let us be talking about flower first. Flower is the reproductive unit of a flowering plant. So what is a flower? We all know it's a specialized shoot and it has parts. A flower has several parts which can be classified broadly, which can be classified broadly into essential holes and non-essential holes. non-essential holes. What is essential holes you may ask? Essential holes are the part of the flower which is directly linked with the phenomenon of reproduction. Directly as in it produces the gametes which carry out the sexual reproduction. And non-essential holes are those parts of the plant which are not directly linked with the phenomenon of reproduction but each has its own important function even the non-essential holes. So let us be talking about the essential holes first. It has had, it has the innermost hole or the pistil. It is the innermost hole, pistil, or also known as gynosium. This is the female hole. It is a female hole and next to pistil is the stem also known as androsium or the male hole. As you can figure out very well by the name female hole, that pistil produces the female gametes and stamen, the male hole, produces the male gametes. So let us talk, let us be talking about the non-essential holes first. Next to stamen would be the corolla. We are going sequentially would be the corolla, commonly known as, all of you can figure correctly, petals. These are usually colored, usually colored and serve as an attractive, attractive mechanism for the flower and next is the outermost hole, calyx, usually green. <clears throat> so we have figured out the four holes of a typical complete flower. A complete flower is the one which has all the four holes in it present and in mature form which has the pistil, the innermost hole, next is the stamen, then the corolla and calyx. Let us be quickly draw, let us be quickly drawing 
a typical LS of a complete flower You can figure out the holes by pointing out them in the flower. We'll be starting innermost first. This is the pistil. These are the stamens. Next is the petals or corolla. And the outermost small, usually green, calyx. This constitutes the LS of a typical complete flower. Alright, so next we will be talking about the two generations that is present in a flowering plant. The sporophyte generation. One, the sporophytic generation. A sporophytic generation is the diploid generation. It bears bodies that produces spores. What are spores, you may ask? Spores are the link between the sporophytic generation and the next gametophytic generation. What is gametophytic generation? We can figure out by the name gametophytic generation is that the gametophytic generation gives rise to the male and female gametes which carries out the sexual reproduction. Gametophytic generation incidentally is haploid. Now generally the flowering plant's sporophytic generation, not generally, it is essentially true, is a dominant. Dominant generation which is seen in most of the cases, you look around the plants are present in the sporophytic generation in diploid state. And the spores that are produced give rise to the gametophytic generation. The reason for mentioning this here is to establish a link between few of the terms that we use in identifying the various parts of the flowers. Now, if you can recall, I had spoken about the androsium. An androsium is also known as micro. Sporo fill. Microsporophyll. You may ask why are we calling it that? So fill, fill usually, this part of the name usually signifies leaf or a leafy structure. Now androsium is that part of the whole which bears parts that produces the microspores. Microspores are haploid and these are also known as male spores. Male spores being smaller in their structure are also known as microspore. Micro means small. And the next hole that we have talked about is the gynosium or the mega sporo. You guessed it right, fill which means the leafy structure, modified leafy structure that contains parts that produces the megaspores. Also have larger number but larger in size than the male spores and hence the name megaspores. Let us be talk, let us be talking about let us be talking about the Microsporophyll or the androsium. 
and androsium. Androsium is the one that bears the male, male reproductive part of a flower and androsium is typically consisting of two broad structures. This is the typical diagram of stamen or androsium also known as the microsporophyll typically comprises of two structures one being the filament filament is the part which connects the anther anther to the flower now what is anther filament is the part which connects the anther to the flower now what is anther you may ask Anther is the part where the magic happens or we know it produces the microspores. A part inside the anther produces the microspores. Typically, if you do a transverse section of an anther, you'll find out structure like this. It's difficult to be representing the sails, but I'll be trying. And so on it goes. Now, an anther, typical anther is bilobed or dithicus. By lobes, you can clearly see that there are two lobes present. It's divided, divided in the middle into two separate lobes. Now, a typically, a bilobed anther is also known as dithicus. A dithicus anther. <clears throat> so, a typical bilobed anther comprises of one, two, three and four. Four pollen sacs. Pollen sacs are the one in which pollens or microspores if you remember microspores. Magically they are also called pollens. The common name which we are all familiar of. Microspores are produced. So, typically a dithicus anther comprises of four pollen sacs. These are each called pollen sacs. And so it is also known as tetrasporangiate. Let us remember this as of now, tetrasporangiate, the term. We will be talking about it in this discussion soon. We are speaking about anthers, the microsporophyll, sorry, retake, huh? Retake. We are speaking about the stamens, the microsporophyll, which consists of the microsporan. Microsporangia. Microsporangia. Microsporangia is the body where microspores are produced. Microspores give rise to pollen. The microsporangia in stamens 
are also called pollen sacs, which we had identified just some time back. <clears throat> so let us be drawing a diagram that helps us figure out the parts of a typical TS of a dithicus anther, where we can figure out where the microsporangia or pollen sacs are. This is an enlarged view of a part of the anther, TS of anther. Here we will be figuring out which of the parts are labelled and which one is the pollen sac. This very part is the pollen sac. So let us be drawing the parts where we can label the anther. First, being the outermost layer. What is the outermost layer called? Epidermis. The outermost layer of an anther, epidermis, followed by The endothecium. The endothecium. The endothecium is followed by the middle layers. What are the middle layers? The middle layers are the groups of cells which surround the pollen sac. Pollen sac or the microsporangia. This is the plural. Singular being microsporangia. So let's, let's come back to the diagram. These are the middle layers. Middle layers are typically two to three layers thick. Now, inside the middle layer, the pollen sacs begin. Pollen sac comprises of two parts. Very important. Very important to note the tapetum. Let's be speaking about tapetum a bit. Tapetum are the groups of cells which provide nutrition to the pollens present inside the pollen sac. Pollens are the pollen mother cells which give rise to the pollen. They provide nutrition till the pollens burst from the anther and they are spread. Tapetum provide nutrition, so nutritive cells. Now inside, further inside the tapetum are the pollen mother cells also known as PMCs. PMCs are diploid, are diploid in number. 
So now we have figured out the various structures of anthers. Now we also know what microsporophyll, microsporangia means. So we have seen the pollen. mother cells, PMCs, which are diploid in number. These are the very cells which give rise to the pollens. Pollens are micro gametophyte. Interestingly, that very small structure, pollens, are the mi micro microgametophytic generation of the plants. Why microgametophytic? Because pollens are the structures that comprises of the microgametes or the sperms. <clears throat> the formation of the pollens from the pollen other cells is carried out through the phenomenon of microsporogenesis. What is microsporogenesis? In the next video, we'll be speaking about exactly what is microsporogenesis and how it gives rise to the microspores which forms the pollens. Thank you.